Hey everyone, it's Ron Johnson. This is the Ron Johnson Show on the Locked On Sports Minnesota Podcast Network. On today's show, hey, we got Randall McDaniel, NFL Hall of Famer, former Vikings offensive lineman. He's going to tell us a lot. He's got some great Tony Dungy stories. He's going to tell us what he would have done in today's NFL. And we're going to talk about the Vikings. Power rankings are out. What are your thoughts? I'll tell you mine. Coming up next. Locked On Sports Minnesota Podcast. It's endless Minnesota Vikings talk with the diverse voices of your local experts. Now the Ron Johnson Show. On the field, in the broadcast booth, Ron Johnson is Minnesota sports. He's played with them, hung out with them, and grown up with all the big names in Minnesota sports. They're hanging out with Ron Johnson. It's the Ron Johnson Show on the Locked On Sports Minnesota podcast. And it starts now. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Ron Johnson Show, and I'm your host, Ron Johnson. Like I said, we got a packed show today. Randall McDaniel. I mean, Randall McDaniel? That's a Hall of Famer. Hall of Fame guard. He's going to tell us his thoughts about Ed Ingram. You're going to want to stick around for that because Ed Ingram is doing something that Randall McDaniel did as a rookie. But you got to stick around to find out what. But he's definitely, trajectory-wise, this season, not career, because don't, I'm not saying he's Hall of Famer, but he's doing some things trajectory wise in his rookie season that Randall McDaniel did in his rookie season. So, hey, maybe there's hope for the kid yet, but you're going to want to stick around and find out. But we got to talk about the Cowboys Vikings game. The Vikings have gotten their power rankings. And when you look across the board in the NFC, the top two teams are clear now it's the Eagles and the Vikings. But the Vikings, there's something about this power ranking that I don't like. But before we jump into that, you can now find Locked On Sports Minnesota on Amazon Fire and Roku. Download the Locked On Sports Minnesota app to get all your favorite shows. Like I said, go to your Roku TV, go to search, hit the uh, search Locked On Sports Minnesota. And just hit download. Download the app. It'll, a little box pops right up on your screen. Click it. And you're, into our, you're into our app. You're watching our shows. You're seeing the videos. And now as I bring Sam Ekstrom into the show, my producer, Sam, the Vikings power rankings are out. And a lot of people put the Vikings number one. I personally, I personally do not like it. Not to say I don't think they are. I would rather be the hunter and not the hunted. I like when they are the underdog. I like that people continue to pump up the Eagles. Pump them up. Pump them all the way up. So when they lose these next three to four games, three probably, the Vikings get that number one seed home field advantage. They don't have to go to Philly for the NFC Championship game. But don't give them the one now, and this is why. It's not the players. It's not Kevin O'Connell. He's a rookie, so he definitely can't sit back and get too, you know, fat cats can't get slaughtered when you're a rookie. It's Minnesota. Like, Minnesota is cursed. When the Gophers were supposed to be in the Big Ten Championship game, and they were there, all day, I mean, I was, I was searching Indianapolis tickets with Fox. Like, we were trying to find – uh, uh, Super or not Super Bowl, but Big Ten tickets. Like we're we're going to Indy. Me and my wife, for everybody, my wife's talking. Oh, if you if we're going to Indy, we're going. Like, and then what happens? They lose to Illinois and Purdue. Even the Illinois lost fine. Illinois was good, but Purdue, they lost to Purdue. And then you look at Minnesota. They're they're up there. There's been years where they're five and one, and then they lose the next four. It's just what happens in Minnesota. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's the ghost of somebody that we forgot about. I don't know if it's the negativity in the air as the snow falls and all the angry people are just mad about the snow. And you live in Minnesota, snow soda and you knew it was coming. I love what PJ Fleck told his players, by the way. It starts snowing and they all showed up to practice kind of looking like, what? He's like, look, you knew what you were signing up for when you came here. If you don't want snow, don't come to Minnesota. And that's, I love that. Mm -hmm. But there's something about this power ranking that I just don't like. I feel like... It's setting us up to walk into the stadium, 325, all happy that we're the number one team in the NFC, 8-1, and one, and they could lose to the Cowboys. And then the negativity creeps back in with all the fans. They were who we thought they were. Shout out to Denny Green. Rest in peace. They were who we thought they were. And we know everybody in Minnesota, the negatives at least, will say that. I keep telling you guys, one more loss is okay. Two more losses is okay. Like, it's going to have, like, 15, 16, and one. 
I don't know if it matters. Can't all be 98 you, Vikings. Exactly. You want some bullets. You don't want to be the Patriots undefeated up into the Super Bowl and then lose because you just, you're not prepared for that moment. I like the way they're winning games. You're prepared for these battles. You're prepared to be down 14 now and just keep fighting and clawing back. But I personally, Sam, I don't like it. I don't like that everybody's talking about them. You turn on every show, every single show, NBC, ABC, MSNBC, Fox News, Fox Sports, whoever. Everybody has some type of, whether it's Kirk Cousins and the change, changing the economy. Like that's what I'm pretty sure uh, the stock show is talking about. Kirk Cousins diamond chains is changing the economy. The cost <laughs> of gold is going up. The cost of diamonds skyrocketed because of Kirk Cousins. I mean, <laughs> come on now. Stop talking about Kirk Cousins and the Vikings. Move on. Go talk about, like we haven't even talked about Pat Mahomes much this season. And he's leading the league. He's an MVP candidate. But everybody's talking about the Vikings nationally. Nobody's talking about Pat Mahomes leading the league. Nobody's talking about Tom Brady 2-0 no, since Giselle left him. And that's the only reason why I personally wish they stayed at like number three. Keep them behind the Chiefs. Uh, I get it's tough to put them behind the Bills because they beat the Bills. Uh, but the Eagles beat them. So who cares the Eagles lost to the, to the commanders? Leave the Eagles up there with the Chiefs and then put the Vikings at three. That's what I was hoping for, Sam, but I don't know. What do you think? Well, if you want an underdog angle, we touched on this earlier in the week. The Cowboys are favored in this game. Cowboys right. minus one. So if you want to spin it that way, and I guarantee you Kevin O'Connell will, he can say, guys, look, you guys still don't have respect. You're at home, and you're two games better record-wise than this team, and you are underdogs. That should be all the Vikings need right there. Now, you touch on something interesting, Ron, about being the hunted versus the, the hunter. The Vikings might have a very interesting December because they could have the division wrapped up. And that means the only thing that they are hunting is that number one seed. So they're going to have to be very focused to go after that, knowing that their, their playoff spot is locked. They don't have as much urgency. Will they be able to play with that same kind of mindset, knowing that they're going to have a home game in the playoffs, but they still can get that number one seed? I personally, I think you go all out to get it. All out. You want the NFC Championship game coming through your building, and that should be enough of a dangling carrot for this team to keep them motivated uh, going forward because there's a lot of guys who are around in 2017, and they don't want to go back on the road to Philadelphia for that big game. Yeah, and, and that's what you, like I said, they've been to Philly. They've seen the fans throw beer at the, at the Vikings fans showing up. They've seen the poles greased. You don't want to go through Philly. Like, you don't want to. It's a different mentality there in the playoffs, too. Rocky, Creed, three, you know, it's just different, Philly. You don't want that. You don't want that problem. You want to bring it to U.S. Bank Stadium. You want your crowd. You want to be able to control your travel. And it's your, it's your, your offense is quiet while their offense struggles to, to hear. That atmosphere for the playoffs, like the Saints game that year, the miracle year, it was nuts. T Payne was in the building. Like it was nuts. And so I can only imagine if Kevin O'Connell pulls this off. And, and we'll talk about this in the round table this week. So stick around Friday, people, for the round table, because we're going to talk about that. Kevin O'Connell, if he finds a way to get to the Super Bowl, not win it. If he gets to the Super Bowl, not if he wins it. I, I think I know the answer. But if he gets to the Super Bowl, where does that put him in the history of Vikings coaches? Like, where do they rank him? Mm. I wonder that. If he gets to a Super Bowl this soon. One, where does he rank them? And two, does Ziggy go ahead and offer him a 10-year contract extension and say, we want you to be the Bill Belichick of Minnesota. Like, we want to keep you around forever. Like, Tony Dutton, we want you to be a staple. We want to put a bronze statue of you in front of U.S. Bank Stadium at some point or in front of Target Field. Like, it, Super Bowl? Like, where do we put him? Do you put, can you put him ahead of Mike Zimmer already if he goes to the Super Bowl in his first year? You know, I know it's tough for some of those other, the less, the, uh, the, um, uh, all those other old Bud coaches, Grant. uh, Bud Grant, I was going to say less Stecco, but I think he had a terrible, uh, time here. Yeah. Stecco's at the <laughs> bottom of the power rankings. Yeah. I, I forgot his was a bad one, but that's just a name in my head. But where do you, but where would they put him? I always wondered that, but we'll have to talk about that on the round table and just kind of, kind of get a temperature like, like Kevin O'Connor on the Super Bowl. Where do you put him? But we got to get to Randall McDaniel. Cause this guy is a hall of famer. 
He has some great stuff to talk about. Offensive line has not gotten a lot of talk as of late, so he has some good stuff to understand. Ed Ingram, Ezra Cleveland, Gary, Garrett Bradbury, and he wants to see some of the NFL change. Like, he wants the NFL to, to get back to doing some stuff he used to do back in his day. Stick around for that. Hey, let me totally mess this up. Sorry. Sorry, here we go. And check out our Locked On Sports Minnesota podcast on YouTube following every Twins, Vikings, Wild, or Wolves game. Our Locked On team hosts are broadcasting live with team insiders. Never miss a podcast by subscribing to Locked On Sports Minnesota on YouTube. We have a word from our sponsors. BetOnline.net, Ron, continues to be your number one source for sports betting info, whether it's football, basketball, baseball, hockey, all the major sports, MMA, boxing, and golf as well. We've already been updating you on the Cowboys-Vikings line. It's Cowboys minus one at the moment. That's down from two, so the Vikings getting a little bit of support. Let's look to college football. The Gophers hosting Iowa, playing for the Pig. Gophers favored by two and a half in that game at home. It's going to be cold. It's going to be wintry on Saturday in Minneapolis, and the over-under is an astonishingly low, record-breaking low, 32 and a half. They're expecting a low-scoring affair. You can get all those lines from all the leagues, all the sports at betonline.net, where the game starts. And this is part of the show that I love. It's the Hang Up with Ron Johnson segment. Randall McDaniel is joining me. It's Cowboys week, but there's a lot going on with this Vikings offensive line. And I want to get Randall McDaniel's thoughts on this. I mean, we've talked to Tony Dungy, uh, talked to Chris Carter a little bit. Uh, So we got a bunch of guys that are going to get in here eventually, but it always starts up front. People forget about how important the offensive line is. And I got a I got a sneaky story that Tony Dungy shared with me last night about Randall McDaniel that uh, I think we're going to enjoy. Randall McDaniel, I want to thank you for uh, joining me on the show today. Right, let's start this out. When you look at your Minnesota Vikings right now, 8-1. and one. When this season started, because I've seen you at a couple games at the alumni event stuff. Uh, when this season kind of started, you know, the alumni stuff you you were part of, did you ever see the team being at where they are right now at eight and one? Um, at first, I thought with a new coach coming in, new system coming in, it was going to take a little while um, for them to get to this point. Um, so I'm, I was, it, so I'm surprised a little bit, but I'm happily surprised that they are where they are. <laughs> um, they are. You can see that they're getting better each week. You can see they're starting to figure it all out. Um, and like you said, um. I was actually at, in California on the golf course getting updates, watching them play <laughs> Buffalo. So that was great to see. That was great to hear. Well, yeah, I mean, it was one of the best regular season games in NFL history. People are dubbing it as uh, Justin Jefferson's NFC Offensive Player of the Week. So we, we know where this team can go. Uh, they beat one of the best teams. So they're a national story now because everybody's saying, you know, they beat – a. I mean, they were the odds-on favorite to win the Super Bowl, the Buffalo Bills were – and the Vikings knocked them off. So now they are the number one team in power ranking as well, which normally Minnesota doesn't get a lot of respect, even when they are that good. Uh, when you look at this offensive line, though, Kirk Cousins early on, Ed Ingram being a rookie, uh, starting rookie guard, uh, has some struggles here and there. But the last couple of games, he's done a great job with the twist. He's done a great job with the double teams, realizing who's the most dangerous guy when there's pressure. Uh, before, but put yourself back in Ed Ingram's shoes as a rookie guard in the NFL how hard is that to kind of get your feet wet and get going uh at the pace that people assume you should um it, it takes a lot I mean it it took me about week seven for things to start slowing okay. down in front of me I mean you you know what you're doing I mean you've done yeah. it all your life for as you you play line but the speed and the pros is things are happening so quick in front of you that you have to be able to adjust before you even know you're making the adjustment so around week seven, week eight for myself also, it slowed down. Even though they were still moving like- at full speed, I could see it before yeah. it even happened. So um, that makes sense that he, he started to figure it out. Um, I, I like being that. Being the rookie, I like that, yeah. I'm new. Yeah. But um, <laughs> I, I'm liking what I'm seeing. I'm glad. I mean, it takes a while for a line to gel. Uh, yeah. And they're, and they're picking it up well, which is good to see. Um, and that means they can only get better. So if that group stays together and they keep doing what they're doing this year, they'll get better as they go. And um, uh, and hopefully we're sitting here <laughs> later on in the year watching them still play. 
Yeah, and when you talk about the entire offensive line, Christian Derrissaw, uh, you got uh, Brian O'Neill, you got Ezra Cleveland. And let's talk about Ezra Cleveland, another guard. Um, you know, for those that are interested in guard play, I think there's some sneaky things that people didn't notice this season. But Ezra Cleveland has been uh, deemed the responsibility to help with protection and make sure the front set. So the center, uh, and this is, I, I, the Rams do it as well. So this must be a Sean McVay you know, tree thing or whoever Sean McVay learned it from, but they're asking the guard to stand up, look around, and then look back at the quarterback to let them know, okay, we're good. He turns, you know, Sunday, Sunday, boom, snap the ball. Or Omaha, if you're a Peyton Manning guy or Josh Allen guy, um, that's basically just saying Omaha, I'm ready to go, or Sunday, Sunday, I'm ready to go. All right, snap the ball. Uh, but for, for, for a guard, though, to have to make sure the protection is set, to make sure, because the center, I guess my guess is, his head's already down. They don't want him to have to do too much turning around, hands still on the ball. Uh, just creates a lot of extra work for the center. So they're asking the guard to do it. Um, is that additional work or is that kind of like, you know what, we're already in, in tune with the center anyway, so that's just easy work for a guard? Um, you know what, I mean, I was taught when I came into the league that we all had to know what the blocking assignment was. We all had to know what the front was, what the look was when we walked up there because we didn't want to be waiting for someone to call it for us. And like you said, yeah. the center typically calls it. Um, back in my day, Louder Milk would come up and he would not even get put his hand down the ball. He would stand up and look at the front and then make the call. But we were responsible for knowing it as well. Um, so it, uh, it does not surprise me that the guards are able to do it. I mean, all the linemen on the, on the line all should know before the quarterback ever makes the decision what's going to be called. Uh, but I, I, I get why they're doing it, why they're having the guards stand up and look because he has on the ball, don't want to take a chance of having it move around. Um, but no, it does not shock me that the guards are able to do that. I mean, like I said, any other lineman can do that. And um, like you, a lot of it, I mean, I'm a, I'm a lineman. So it all starts up front. Um, we, all, we have to know what's going on before everyone else knows what's going on because we're the ones where it all starts with. We're the ones that going to make the blocks and get the key positions like that. So um, it does not surprise me at all that the guards are making that call. And this team, uh, it's the same team pretty much. Let's be real. Like they haven't added much. Patrick Peterson was here last year. Harrison Smith, Cam Dantzler, um, you know, Chris Boyd from a special team standpoint. Now they did get, you know, different kicker punters, uh, new special teams coach. Uh, but the, the Dalvin Cook, Justin Jefferson, Adam Thielen, uh, they did add TJ Hawkinson late, but – Kirk Cousins, these pieces were here. Darisaw, uh, Ezra Cleveland, Brian O'Neill, like these guys have all been here. So not much has changed other than you add Zadarius Smith now, eight and a half sacks. Uh, you go to a 3-4 defense, so a little bit different front look for, for teams that, that are used to the old 4-3 defense. But when you think about a coach like Kevin O'Connell coming in and getting the, the camaraderie, uh, getting the quarterback to come out of his shell and kind of be like a laid-back guy throwing the chains on on the plane, um, what what do you attribute to his style of coaching that's working well for the Vikings? Well, well like you said, you got that core that's been there, which is great to have that core. Um, you got the new coach, O'Connell comes in, and he's able, I mean, everybody wants to play when the new coach comes in, but yeah. he's now able to get those guys to jail. I mean, that core has been there, but now he has them playing together even more. They they, they understand what the other person's trying to do. They they. I mean, like I said, you just want to play well. Um, but like I said, that solid core is there. Um, you didn't have to rebuild a lot. You had the pieces that you needed. And you just got that push now. You got the new coach and the new style, and everybody's enjoying it. It's like a whole new atmosphere, um, and that's great to have. So it's, like you said, the guys know each other. They, they've done this before. Um, they're gelling now. And that's and that's what my opinion is why they're playing so well. They've been up together for a while that they now understand how, what they want to do, where they want to go. And that makes for a great season. And, and as a lineman, I mean, Christian Darisaw loved it. Uh, you could see his his joy when he saw Kirk Cousins with his shirt off on a plane with chains on. <laughs> Uh, if, if what, like, could you imagine, or what would you be like, what would it be like for you if you walked on the plane, you know, and in 10 minutes into the flight, your quarterback is shirtless with, uh, you know, eight diamond chains on sunglasses dancing, you know, back there with the defense, like, where would your mindset have been in that moment as offensive lineman? <laughs> I mean, I would have loved it. I mean, we didn't <laughs> have the social media like they do today when I was playing, but yeah. we, we had some quarterbacks, I mean, I mean. Uh, Brad Johnson would always sit back in the, the equipment room with all the linemen. We always played cards back there, ate dinner back there. 
and Bull, we called him Bull. He was back there in the middle with us all the time, uh, joking around, having that good time. Um, so that does not surprise me. Uh, I would have loved it. I mean, if we had social media back then, it would have been fun <laughs> to watch our quarterbacks do that. As a lineman, uh, I mean, you want to see that. And that, I mean, that, like I said, that's what they're doing. They're gelling. They're, they're getting to know each other. They're, they're comfortable with each other. And, I mean, that, all that does is motivate the guys to even play better, play harder in front of him so they keep doing this great job that they're doing. Yeah, because do you think it helps? Because I've, I've seen this pop up lately. Uh, quarterbacks that have lost the respect of their offensive line or their team, uh, when they get sacked, nobody's running over to help them up. Uh, but what you've noticed is Kirk Cousins now, the minute he's touched, the minute he's pushed, you see a couple offensive linemen run over, pick him up, hurry up, make sure he's okay, you know, get back to the huddle, whatever. Do you think that helps in that too? Like just being loose, having fun, being one of the guys, do you think that helps in, in, in transitions to on the field, kind of respect and care and like that protector mentality comes in uh, with the rest of your team for their quarterback? Oh, that definitely plays into that. I mean, I, like I said, I go back to my era. No one was going to touch our quarterback. If they did, we would be back there knocking the guy off, getting him up right away. Um, it is, it is that thing. You, no one's supposed to touch the quarterback and line it or that way. We were the guys in the huddle that made sure, hey, this is how things have to be done. Um, but yeah, it is always. I mean, yeah, you don't want it to be your guy that hits the quarterback, but right. if someone's near him or too close to him, you're going to make sure people get away from him and you're going to get him back up. And then you, I mean, we used to whisper in the quarterback, hey, look, man, he won't touch you again. Don't worry about it. I got that protected. Um, if he is too close to you and looks like he's going to hit you, then I'm going to take a holding film to make sure he never touches you this whole entire game. But it, it is always fun to see the lineman run back when it does happen, knock people off and get the quarterback back up where they can keep, continue the game to make sure things run smoothly. Well, talking about, uh, you know, your protector mentality, your, you know, holding, grabbing, whatever. Uh, the NFL lately has been calling like offensive linemen are knocking defensive linemen's hands down. That's just old school. And as they're falling, offensive linemen are falling on top of them, which is normal. Now they're starting to call that a hold uh, because the refs can't see what happened. It looks like they're pulling the guy down. And as the game evolves and changes and they're trying to stop some of this barbaric stuff like that, um, do you think that's something the league needs to review and make sure they don't take out of the game where just because a defense lineman goes down and offense lineman on top of his back is not an illegal play? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? As a lineman, I mean, you're told to do that. You've been taught that all your right. life. You, you're blocking the guy. He tries to jump up. You catch him perfectly in the ribs or down the side or, he, or in the hip that's throw him off balance when he's leaping. And then you're supposed to cover him. It's not holding. But I, I see why they look at it like that, because all they see is the result as the guy's going down. I know, or they think Correct. That, yep. oh, you had to hold him to get him in that position. I mean, I, I used to do a push-pull technique all the time, and I would show it to the ref before the game. And I, and I would do it to him, and he would, I'd go, it's going to look violent <laughs> like I tugged him, but I'm not. This is all I'm doing. And he goes, oh, you're right. That's not holding. And the one few times that he did nail me for it, I was like, that's what I was telling you about. Uh, <laughs> and I... I I, I don't like the fact that they're taking it away I mean, uh, from the linemen. Uh, I mean, that's, that is your job. Your job is to make sure those hands are down when the quarterback's going to throw a pass. Um, if they're going to leap up, you're supposed to, they're supposed to pay a price. Uh, and then they won't leap up and even put those hands up. But, no, I, I think the refs need to understand line play and how it's done and not take that advantage away from us. Uh, for doing our jobs out there. I kind of gave you a heads up early. I talked to Tony Dungy yesterday because uh, he told me he's uh, he's covering the Vikings Patriots game. So he'll be here for Thanksgiving. Um, and so he and I are going to, you know, he's going to jump on the show at some point. But we were just chatting about, you know, because Mel Blunt is my godfather. So I reached out to Mel Blunt as okay. well because I know um, his era in the 70s and 80s played against the Vikings a bunch. So I always love to get their feedback. Uh, but Tony told me a story. He said in the coaching room, because I was a coach for the coach with Tony, so I remember these meetings, and he kind of explained it the same way. We sometimes just talk about players. Like when we're in the meeting, we just talk about players, good or bad. Like it's it's a it's a it's a covenant. <laughs> okay. Like whatever whatever happens in the coach's room doesn't get back to the players, <laughs> unless somebody's pissed off. But they said they thought you in, in 1992. Tony said him and a few coaches thought you were like this gentle you know, giant, like just, you know, didn't have a mean bone in your body. Like you do your job, you show up to work every day, you know, you're a good offensive lineman, but you're not like Kyle Turley. You know, they, they're like, oh, he's, 
just he's not a he's not a net he's not gonna eat raw meat you know and then they say they put you at fullback against the bears and he said you absolutely killed mike singletary and he said at that moment he's like oh okay he has it he just doesn't always show it so what do you remember about that moment and, and you know how you kind of played i mean i'll <laughs> I, I i've gotten that my whole career uh everybody assumes that i mean i i enjoy playing football uh, when I'm off the field, football is not with me. I, it's about where right. I'm doing at that time. But I played fullback in college, too, in short yard situation. They would move me back to the backfield. And I'll be honest, that's the one time that the linebacker has to take on that lead block. He cannot avoid me. He cannot try to get by me. He has to come to me. And when they start putting me back in the backfield running those plays, I mean, I would sit back there smiling, going, I am just going <laughs> to obliterate this guy in front of me because he has to take me on. And so I had been doing it all year long, but that 92 <laughs> game against the Bears, it was Mike Singletary on a Monday night football game. And I know he's, he said that his foot was up in the air when I caught him. Uh, I think people forget is, yeah, people forget that I, I ran a 4 5 40 for a big man. Oh. And, and I didn't go full speed until I knew, made the, knew for sure they committed to that hole. And the moment I knew he was coming and was starting to pick that foot up, I turned on full speed and caught him. Perfect. Uh, uh, Terry Allen was behind me running the ball. We got the first down in that short yard situation. Uh, but, oh, I love that. Yeah, yeah. there's another <laughs> side of me. I mean, if you, if you talk to guys that I played against on the field, I'm not the nicest guy when I'm playing. <laughs> uh, and then, then throwing short yards in situations, I am really not a nice guy at all. I mean, I, I did that when Roger Craig was behind me back there too. Also, I mean, I, 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 was, I wanted to spike the ball for Roger Craig every time we scored on a play like that. But oh God, I, I love doing that. So yeah, there's another side of me when I'm out on the field. When I come off the field, yeah, you're gonna see the smile and everything, having a good time. <laughs> but on the field and in certain moments, yeah, when I know I got a guy dead to rights, uh, it's not gonna be a good day for him. So in Mike Singletary's mind, if his feet were on the ground, you wouldn't have got him. That's in his mind, but I'm pretty sure it would have been the same results. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I'm glad Tony gave me that one because, uh, yeah, I mean, I, honestly, I, I, I do agree with him. Like, but that's good. Like, I think uh, I've heard like Nate Burleson recently. I just saw Ryan Clark bring this up. Uh, I just saw Michael Irvin talk about this, that, yeah, like just because we can be barbarians on the field, that's not who we have to be off the field. Because uh, a lot of people get that confused that because you're this nice, smiley guy, they're like, I can't see you ever. And I'm not going to lie, like watching games from the sideline now, uh, I don't, I can't remember or feel myself like trying to stiff arm, run a guy over, just put my helmet through a guy's chest. I'm like, it seems so brutal. But maybe because I'm 42 and I'm old and it looks like it hurts. Um, I just, it just gets me every time when I'm like, man, what is, like, this is a brutal game. It, it it definitely is. Yeah, I I sit there and like the, the kids at the school that I was work I worked at um, all thought the same thing. Then they would watch some film and they're like, "Is that really you, Mister McDaniel?" And I go, "Yeah, that is me." Uh, <laughs> I go, "That's that's what I used to do." But yeah, even my nieces and nephews thought the same thing. They were they they got to watch me play when they were young kids, and they got to come on the field uh, pregame stuff. And I'm joking mm -hmm. around pregame out in the field with them because they got to get down there, and then I walk out for the game to start and they were, they happened to still be on the sideline. And my one nephew said, man, uncle Randall, you didn't even talk to me. You, you threw sweat on me. You did this to me. And I go, I didn't see you. I go, it's game time at that point. And that's what my nephew said. They go, you're a different person when you're playing. And I go, and then that's how it's supposed to be. So, yeah, but I, I well, I'm too old to do it now. <laughs> They might need you for the Super Bowl to play fullback, though. You never know. They might need you back there. <laughs> nah. The body's willing, but the, <laughs> the mind's willing. Body's not. <laughs> well, we got the Daily Three coming up with myself, Sam, and uh, Randa McDaniel. But remember, when you subscribe to Locked On Sports Minnesota, you're getting endless Vikings talk with local experts. Subscribe to the free Locked On Sports Minnesota podcast feed wherever you find your podcast, and make sure you check out all of our videos on the Minnesota YouTube channel. And we have a word from our sponsors. I want to thank everyone for watching or listening to Ron Johnson today. Also, check out uh, Locked On Sports today. 
Uh, from the games that matter to the biggest stories in sports, go beyond the scoreboard and behind the scenes with local experts and insights only Locked On can provide. Locked On Sports Today, available on this app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. I want to keep the Tony Dungy topic rolling, um, and I want to get a story about Tony Dungy or some advice that he gave you, because you both have these experiences with Tony. Uh, Ron, we'll start with you. What's something you took from Tony Dungy during your time around him? Man, I took a lot. So the one, the funniest one would be uh, Peyton Manning runs his team. Uh, I was a young, you know, I was not young. Well, yeah, I was young. I was in my 30s. Um, and I was a first year coach, came in as assistant receivers coach, special teams guy. So my job was, you know, making sure I made the copies for the meetings, make sure I got all the coaches, the changes in the playbook. And uh, my, my task weekly was go to Peyton Manning with the new plays and, and talk to Peyton and say, hey, here's some of the plays Clyde Christensen and uh, Tom Moore are coming up with. What are your thoughts? I got to take it back to the coaches. And for some reason, this one day, and Jeff Saturday warned me, like, Peyton is going to go forever because he has so many different changes he wants to make in his head. And so Peyton took, like, a legit, like, 20 minutes for me to sit in his locker. So I'm like, golly, come on, man. And I'm, like, looking at my watch. I'm nervous. Coach's meeting has started. So I'm like, I'm late now. So I'm so I literally get Peyton's final take because I'm like, I can't rush Peyton. It's Peyton Manning. I literally sprint through the facility. I hand the, mach I hand the papers to – because it's old school. So we still had, like – we had one of our coaches that was so old – he had the old school thing that John Randall probably had when he was in high school, which is like the, the clear sheets you put on the uh, deal and it projects it onto the screen. I forgot what those even called the projector, but it was like clear. So I had to get those copied. I had to get the other stuff copied. Um, and so as I'm running, I see Tony Dungy and I'm like, hey, coach, sorry. Here's the uh, final plays. Peyton took a little bit longer. And in that moment, he said, don't worry about it. You get it. And I was like, huh? He's like, <laughs> we're waiting on Peyton. And in that moment, I kind of realized, like, there's hierarchy to this. The other one he always told me uh, was uh, always trust in God. You know what I mean? I think that was the best one he told me, too, is, you know, God's going to work it out. Just trust. And uh, you're going to go through a lot of stuff in life, but just trust. So those are the two that always stuck with me. How about you, Randall? Wow. Hey, overhead projector is what it's called. I mean, that's all <laughs> yeah, I Yeah, yep, that switched. was it. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, for me, I mean – with Tony, I, I mean, he was a coach with the Vikings, and I got him when I went down to Tampa. Um, main thing I got on is Tony is, I mean, no matter what you do, you got to be humble. Um, you see that in man, just being humble and, and and also being accountable for your job without having to scream and yell at you. I I, I loved him for that. Um, and then just as you said, giving back to the community the way Tony does and the programs that he he has created, started, and still doing. Um, that's still with me today uh but um but yeah just i mean everything that tony's accomplished the big thing for me is just how humble he is about how things are going in his life and i mean how can you not i mean like, like i said my last two years down in tampa were great because i got to come down and play with tony and play for him and i and i enjoyed every moment of that so i i, I appreciate him doing that allowing me to have that opportunity yeah, and I'd say the uh, the other thing Tony always told me, too, about uh, Randall McDaniel was uh, his ability to, like, practice, but then also find ways to not practice as he was a vet. Like, the veteran way to, like, oh, we can, we can change this up. Let's, let's switch this. <laughs> hey, man, 14 years, you got to figure something out along the way. That's veteran savvy. Oh, man. No doubt about it. All right, question number two. I want you both to think back to the best team that you were a part of. Um, Randall, I might be fishing for a little 98 Viking story here, um, but I want you to think about what separated that team from other teams you've been a part of. What put them over the top, whether it was on field or something in the culture of that team? We'll start with Ron. Uh, I got to go with the Ravens. I mean, yeah, I didn't play much with the Bears just one year. So I got to go with the Ravens just because of uh, Ray Lewis. And even from a college standpoint, like I had never been a part of a team that had a true leader, you know, with the, with the Gophers. Uh, you know, we were a team of a bunch of guys. Like we had a bunch of – but Ray Lewis, like, commanded respect. Uh, and that's from the opponents. Like walking onto a field – and you could see receivers watching him warm up, running backs watching him warm up. Like it was just a, it was a deep, this different atmosphere. And what set us apart? I say the locker room because we had clicks. So we would always have clicks. Like we, we, I don't know for how many years we did this. It was the dumbest thing ever, but this is what football players are bored. Uh, we had, we call it the zoo and the jungle. And so it, each position was an animal. So like I think the, the, 
the tight ends were tigers, the linebackers were lions, the receivers were gazelles, and so on and so forth. The offensive linemen were hippos or elephants, and defensive linemen were hippos. And so what I learned in that is like, and then the DBs were hyenas. And this is why we say this. Those guys would attack everybody. They had no loyalty to each other. They would attack everybody in the locker room. And it became fun. But then what I learned is as a pride of group of animals, when we got together, we attacked everything else as a group. Like we would have fun with each other, but we attacked everybody else. Even Rex Ryan. Rex Ryan walked because we used to put tape up in the jungle. Whenever it was jungle time, they put tape up. And if anybody crossed that line and you're not a part of a pride, you're going to get attacked. And Rex Ryan didn't believe it. He walked into the locker room one day joking. And those linebackers and DBs put him in a laundry cart and pushed him into the parking lot. It was the funniest thing ever. And it was a snowstorm. Funniest thing ever. And uh, I just remember they took they took the same approach to the field. Like we almost got into a fight with the Steelers at their bus and saying that everybody, not to condone fighting, but everybody rallied to the front of the bus because Ray Lewis was about to get into it. So, yeah, it, it's just I, that's what I, I say, the culture of that, just being a team and together. Mm hmm. Wow. Your your defense sounds like um, our offensive line that year. I mean, <laughs> anything that got in the way, anything that interfered with our team, we were we were we were there. Nothing nothing took place in that locker unless the linemen allowed it to get happen. But I mean, I know you want to hear the '98 season, and, and it's true, it's the '98. But I I had that same experience in college the year that we won the Rose Bowl the first time, where mm -hmm. the team had been together for those four years, and now coming up on our senior year. We all sat around that, that off season talking about this is our time. We've done this together for so long. Let's go out and prove to everybody. And then we won the Rose Bowl that year. Uh, the 98 season, that same thing. I mean, nothing truly changed. We had one piece added, which was Moss coming in. And, and, but we had all set back going, hey, man, we've done this enough. Let's go out and show people who we really are. And so that 98 season, yeah, it was... They were like on offense. There was nothing we knew we couldn't do. We could be down by 20 points. And we're in the huddle laughing and joking, going, all right, let's get this done. Let's go back and do our job. Let's take care of business. Uh, we always knew that we were going to be able to win. So that year was just the best. I mean, like I said, everything just gelled. We just knew we could do whatever we wanted anytime, and we would go out and do it. So. You weren't down by 20 points too often that season. You were uh, you were the team up 20 <laughs> no. points, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, think I got one the Titans more. Game work. The Titans game? Is that what you said? Yeah, we, we, we had to do a little work in the Titans game to come back playing at um, Vanderbilt University at that time. But we still got it done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that was to go 15-1, and one, right, in the last week of the season? Yeah, it was. Yep. Yep, I remember it. Um, all right, last question. Think about your position today versus how it was in, say, the year 2000 or the year 2002 or whenever your career ended. Um, what is different about your position now than it was 20-ish years ago? Ron, we'll start with you. Uh, freedom. Like, when I played, you couldn't go across the middle freely. Like, they could decapitate you if they wanted to. Uh, you could get bumped at the line of scrimmage and smacked in the head. Uh, like Mel Blunt and my dad both play corner for uh, the Steelers, and they would tell me every chance they get from the age of like 11 to probably when I was in college that they would have beat the hell out of me at the line of scrimmage because I was a bully. I was 6'3", 230 pounds, and I was a bully at the line of scrimmage with smaller DBs, and Mel was 6'4", and he was like, oh, I would have beat your ass. I would have smacked you in the head. I would have had you looking out your ear hole, and I'm just like, Y'all can't do that. Like, you can't beat people up. And But then I go back and watch Steelers film, and they did. They literally punched people. They would – I mean, it's so it's different now. And so I looked at – like, I just saw a highlight of Brian Dawkins, and I remember we played the Eagles. And I remember he came out the tunnel doing, like, a gorilla stump type deal. And, and I was thinking to myself, like, this dude is crazy as hell. Like, this dude is crazy. And you don't have that anymore. You don't have those crazy, like, safeties. Roy Williams came on the show this week, and he talked about the same with the Cowboys. He used to impose his will. Uh, safeties can't do that anymore. You can't just hit a receiver after take. You got to let them take three full, full steps, and you still can't hit them hard. So I'd say it's a lot more freedom. Like you can run across the middle of the field, knowing like you might get hit, but you're not going to get killed. Um, you know, at the line of scrimmage, you get that extra half a yard now. You don't have to be like I watched the Deion Sanders uh, versus Jerry Rice. Jerry had to be right up under Deion. Like you could not. There was no space in the jam. Now there's space, so the receivers can get cute and do all that stuff. So I think that's a big difference. There's a lot more freedom now. Wow, that's true. 
Uh, but for linemen, I, it's it's still a lot of this, uh, similar. But uh, what I know is the difference when I played, what I used to do, you don't see a lot of the guards pulling anymore, getting out in the open field as, on many, as many plays. Um, back in my day, I used to love being able to pull, run the traps, get out there in the open field, and just light the linebackers up when they would come across. Uh, uh, you, you don't see a ton of that anymore. Uh, it's all between the box now, most of it. Uh, uh, like I said, that's the one thing that frustrates me. I mean, like I said, they're bigger, faster, stronger, but I still would like to see them be able to pull out in that open field. I mean, especially now today when the DB's not allowed to take your knees out when you're running at them, they got to take you on. <laughs> God. Uh, that's the only time I wish I could still play now with that rule where they can't uh, go through your knees to get to that to that running back. Uh, God, I, I'd have about 20, 30 more pancakes added to my total running through guys like that if they couldn't hit me in the knees. But, I mean, my thing is, yeah, if if the, I would love to see guards get out in the open field today. I mean, God, I, mean I, I like that rule because you know, you know how it was. Back in the day, that cornerback would come up and he submarine you in a heartbeat. Um, and now oh, yeah. today they can't do it. Oh, I mean, there's not a cornerback that would finish the game if I could play now today. <laughs> <laughs> That's why Cam Dancer got hurt. For people that want to know what he's talking about, go back and watch the Cam Dancer play. He submarines uh, the D lineman, but then the running back catches him like right before his, his, he's able to go down. So he pushes his body back, his ankle yeah. gets caught. Uh, but yeah, that's and they threw the flag. They threw the flag on Cam Dantzler, even though he got hurt in that play and made the tackle. They threw the flag because you cannot, yeah. you cannot go through the, the through the uh, guard or the tackle, whoever is coming at you. You cannot go through their legs, especially in like screen game. You can't just run through yeah. and blow up the screen anymore. You gotta, you're right. You gotta take that block on. So, yeah, you you probably would have had you about five more years of playing, protected your knees. <laughs> True. You could have been out there like Tom Brady in your forties, playing playing guard. <laughs> hey, I ain't gonna go that far. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank Randall McDay for joining me on the Ron Johnson Show. I want to thank Sam, Matt DeBris back there working the keys. And if you want endless Vikings talk, make sure you subscribe to Locked On Sports Minnesota on YouTube, where you can find all of our videos, all of our shows, instant podcasts after every game, and the Vikings press conferences, delivering all the biggest news. Like our videos, leave your comments, and let us know your thoughts below. What was your best Randall McDaniel moment? Is 1998 the best Viking season you ever seen? Let us know what you think. Have a great day.